here we are in the last half hour of the inaugural Outside of Art Fair, and we're in the gallery, the curated show. I'm Stuart Shepherd, the curator. I'm uh, uh, have been here all weekend, and I've been talking up this exhibition. And uh, with you know, all modesty aside, this is a a show that I'm really proud of because the quality of work is as good as it gets, and it hasn't been shown in this country before. And, and to prove that it's uh, as good as it gets, we've got work from one of the top uh, uh, workshops for people with disabilities in California, Creativity Explored. The show was set up to show different um, sectors, different artists, different voices, as if it was an art fair. It's not, it's not, the way art fairs work internationally is that different galleries hire space and they, they showcase their best work. So we've tried to replicate the feel of the art fair with different sectors. This work from Creativity Explored. This artist's name is Camille Holvoe. I don't know how to pronounce that name. Um, my particular interest in the work is the comic character, the loving treatment of colour and the craft, but also the, uh, the text. This is, in fact, a portrait of the artist. I've positioned her work next to a piece by Ray Ritchie. Ray's one of my favourite Wellington artists, self-taught artist, Ray's getting on in years, he must be around 80. This is a kinetic piece. Um, she's like a goddess with raised arms and a gesture of welcome, and she reflected by the work behind her. Oop, over here. It's been... This is a work by uh, Evelyn Rays, also from Creativity Explored. Evelyn's been making a splash in the contemporary art scene in California. I think you can see why the work just has this minimalist purity, and uh, I have seen other work of hers which is quite large scale, but this is her particular motif. It's unusual for a self-taught artist, the strong uh, minimalist uh, response to materials. I think this is uh, one of the most delightful and um, amusing pieces in the show. Daniel Green from San Francisco. Again, uh, I think I'm attracted to text alongside illustration and uh, this charming distortion of the figure, particularly the content is great. These are uh, California firemen showing off their muscles. Only in San Francisco. I don't think Auckland firemen do that. These are Samoan policemen on parade in, in uh, San Francisco as well. The text includes a whole list of things, including... Uh, TV shows, and different times. I like lists, and I think a lot of self-taught artists seem to be um, compelled to list things, to make sense of the world. A friend of mine from Wellington, uh, we looked at one of his figurines before. These, these images are of sculptures Ray made. These are life-size sculptures of figures which became too cumbersome inside the house. Ray... Uh, was encouraged by his wife, Margaret, to put them outside. He did so, but he wanted to record them. <laughs> so these are paintings of sculptures. He's also a poet, and this uh, somewhat comic madcap poetry accompanies the image. Great detail. I've given quite a big section to Ray. I'm not sure why, but I think his work is strong... I think it's completely uh, his vision, and it's nice to see the work in a nice, clean space. Same for any artist. The context, a clean, respectable context, does help the work be seen. He's got a high key color. I think this piece here is one of my favorites. She's missing a crown. Her crown was a old uh, rubber plug for a sink. She, I see her as a domestic goddess. Possibly this is Margaret, his wife. The, um, the fork is detachable. He's very practical. This piece by Ray, I think it deserves its own wall. We thought about it. It's one of my favourite pieces by Ray, and it is, obviously it's this silhouette emanating the fact that there's eyes. It doesn't need an explanation, does it? No. It's a great piece of design. Great piece of painting. I don't think it's framed to its best effect. I think it needs a bit more space because it's such a strong um, 
image. It's like a 1970s image of time travel or something like that. A lot of people like Ray's work because it does uh, seem to come from a, a teenage 1970s bad boy uh, graffiti tradition or 1970s comics from England. But it, it is an irreverent sense of humour that he has. Now we're looking at the work of Rhys Tong. It is gratifying to see red dots on Rhys's work. Uh, he would be so thrilled. I think for a self-taught artist, who most self-taught artists I know don't have an income, a sale of an artwork isn't just about money. It's way more than that. It is, it is a actual recognition of them as a person, I think. I think Irwin would agree. It's very meaningful. Uh, and that's part of what this art fair is about. It is actually acknowledging the people. But uh, Rhys is a self-taught artist from Wellington, and he has this manner of simplifying stuff in his world into a kind of pictogramma. Um, these are pictograms, so, and they're almost like cave paintings or they're simplifications of whatever's going around. I love his selection of subject matter. Uh, he, he, does, he tends to work in series. I don't know why he got picked up on. He picked up on Brazilian dance. He did a whole series of music, musical instruments. Uh, he picks up on ethnic stuff. He got obsessed by America, America people. That became a series. I don't know how he arrived at this motif for a body. A raised right hand with three or four dots. But I admire that language, that visual language, however he arrived at it. He's quite thoughtful. He thinks quite hard and then he comes up with this uh, visual graphic solution. This piece over here is a little bit unusual. He doesn't us usually use two colours. Usually it's monochromatic. This is a golf course viewed from above. He wouldn't know it, but there is a little uh, hole with a flag in it up there. But in that case... The content doesn't matter. It's a, it's a lovely piece of painting. And the effort to make lines, uh, create spaces, the abstract uh, properties um, apply to any modernist work, I think. And it, it just looks good on the wall. It's got presence. It's a favourite piece of mine. Oh, that bird is nice too. Just, this, uh, just in, in terms of modernist art, eccentric shapes... There's an intuitive composition, and it's funny. That's the goofiest bird you could ever see, just about. Part of the idea of this show was to actually inform an audience that's new to the field of outsider art or self-taught art and to prove that there is outsider art has its own lineage in New Zealand. It's not a known history, but it does exist. And one of the foremost experts in the field of self-taught art or contemporary folk or folk is John Perry of Helensville. He's got an extraordinary collection of work. I invited John to contribute a component of this curated exhibition to give a historic uh, um, anchor to the show. And he's selected the work of four artists from his collection. This has been a treat for me and for other audience members <laughs> uh, to see this work because it's very rare. The work of Joseph Alark, I was not aware of before. This, this is probably the most idiosyncratic, wacky image of the ballerina Pavlova I've ever seen. Uh, the people who have been coming here have, have just admired the sustained, eccentric vision of these artists. I was not aware of the work of Peter Vesey. Uh, he only died this year, which is a... Which is a shame. Um, super delicate illustrational style. Uh, very, very fine work. I guess the work could be called naive. Alark's work is certainly naive. But there's a. This could also be an early clean with the clean cut out spaces. So that's a delight. That wedding lady is amazing. So is the church. That crispness of edge is, is terrific, spectacular. Dave O'Neill, born in Dublin, 1918. All these artists have stories. And there's, 
there's, there's almost two ways of looking at this work. One is actually looking at the life story of the artist. The other way is simply looking at the work in terms of its formal quality. Uh, there's a lot of history. His work has been shown in other exhibitions. He died in Levin. I'm not sure of the period. Uh, again, I guess it could be called naive. Yeah, so in, in line with the idea behind the curation of this show, that there was a historic perspective, I'm not sure if Barry Brickle would like to be included under the title historic, because he's very much an active contemporary artist. But he does occupy a niche in the story of artists who have gone out on their own, and he's, I think he's a bit heroic in that regard. He wasn't entirely on his own. He, he went to the Coromandel. There was a network of artists who were his supporters and friends. I wanted to include that story in this exhibition. So I've got two works by Barry. He's not known as a painter. I, I think of Barry, he's a famous potter, as a, he's still experimenting. I see these paintings as somewhat visionary and experimental. And uh, for that reason, I'm really delighted to have the work in the show and to have it alongside the work of his friends, uh, Tom Elliott, a wood carver. I'm not even sure if Tom still carves. <clears throat> His work follows almost a, a medieval tradition of narrative relief work. Very finely detailed, gorgeous lump of cowrie finished to a high degree. And what I love about this particularly, I just love the aspect of this character with the head on a slant opening the window. It's got a, a Delight, just, there's lots of beautiful details. When you do relief carving, there's various problems that have to be resolved. How to get the figure in 3D, but only use uh, frontal space. And uh, this is part of a series of works about the same scale that tell stories. Tom's partner is a painter, uh, Waylon Elliott whose paintings chronicle events in her life and in the life of the community. Uh, the titles, often she depicts or commemorates particular events in the community. This is a wedding scene. I'm not sure who this is. Uh, somebody, uh, a friend or family member at work, in the workshop. All these characters are particular people with particular names and particular stories. I'm not even sure if there's a name for the art of artists who chronicle events. So it's a, it's a painted documentary, uh, and it's sort of uh, full of delightful knowing details. A couple whispering, uh, some guy taking a photograph, somebody taking care of the drinks. Um, beautiful little paintings. And, you know, it's, I'm really grateful to Waylon who helped get this work here at the last minute. A lot of this show was put together with limited resources and a tight timeline, so um, it's really gratifying to see the work together here. This is a very special little corner, the work of Susan Te Kahurangi King. Susan's uh, renown in international art circles is, is, is rocketing skyward. It's, it, it's great to have this selection of three works here, selected by her sister Petita, but Susan has an exhibition on at the uh, Andrew Edlin Gallery in New York. Andrew Edlin is the director of the New York Outsider Art Fair. So there's a nice little connection between the big city and here. Uh, anyway, the three fabulous drawings by Susan as um, a great representative of the crossover between a self-taught artist and the contemporary art scene. And she's just got some rave reviews from... Uh, the staff reporter for arts for the New York Times. So that's rare. It's very rare for a New Zealand artist to be uh, acclaimed at that high level. I'm a huge fan of Susan's work. Simply, the skill level is extraordinary, let alone the content, which is wild. And what gets me, because I teach drawing, her engagement with the drawing process is... Uh, sensational.
even, and these works were done when she was a child, so even as a child, she was so into the drawing process that she would chisel the lead of her pencil to create two edges and a flat surface so she could get the fine line for creating contour lines and then a flat edge for shading. Now, to me, that's a, that is a very high level of engagement for a child in the process of drawing. The treatment of these hands and the movement and the way, different ways of looking at the hands um, shows a, a fantastic uh, un engagement with the world, with looking at the phenomenal world. So it's almost like she was a scientist. So when something appeared on her radar, her visual radar, she would examine it and then play it back through her drawings. That level of engagement, that's what has been appreciated in New York by all sorts of uh, experts and critics. It's very unusual work, and it's a unique sort of contribution to the whole story of drawing, I think. Uh, this is the work of Colin Corobin. Colin's become a friend. He works at Vincent's Art Workshop in Wellington. I used to work there, so I met Colin through the job. I guess Colin is a text-based artist. He, his favourite medium is ballpoint pen on paper. It took me a while to realise that Colin was actually also a book artist. The work of Martin Thompson. This is a, I think this is a lovely selection. His, Martin is probably one of the best-known uh, self-taught artists in the country, and his works, you know, he's the first artist to be collected by the American Folk Art Museum which is a great, a great mark of uh, respect and, uh, and a great you know, indication of the significance that that institution attributes to his work. It's interesting that the curator who first found his work made the link between the collection of um, quilting that the American Folk Art Museum has and Martin's process. Uh, Martin, not only is he an amazing mathematician, te technician, but he's also a colorist, and he's fascinated by the idea of visual dazzle. These are day glow orange drawings. His process of using a scalpel, he probably wouldn't want to be talked about. I think Martin's interested in achieving perfection. This is an early piece, but um, where the process can be seen and the, um, the slightly degraded quality of the paper is also seen. Collectors don't care about that. They see that as part of the object of the drawing. The fact that the cellar tape on the reverse side is starting to stain the front. Uh, his work is seen as, as drawing objects because the back and the process is part of the, uh, the magic of the work. This is the work of Roger Morris. Roger is a sculptor who works with often resistant materials. His work is quite physical. He works with stone and steel, often in large scale. These monotypes on a plasticized surface is a technique that he's, he's evolved. It's individual to him. The process involves inking and removing and then applying and stenciling, a, a series of techniques. And it is, uh, these uh, seem like um, Roger's sketches. Obviously, the graphic quality is super strong. When I was installing the work, I uh, recognized that actually these shapes are TV screens. And uh, Roger's politics of concern for what's happening to society and the American military might and its influence on our the images and information that's mediated that we get, I think it's, it's perfectly encapsulated in this. I hope he likes the installation. That was my way of showing the work. And it's turned out that, um, pleasingly turned out, that this feels like a uh, photo booth or a photographic installation with these spotlights and this configuration. What else to say about his work? If he was here, he could discuss the work with far greater eloquence and... <laughs> And meaning, but uh, I'm happy with this installation, and uh, a lot of people have been uh, delighted and impressed by this cluster of work. Uh, this was always intended 
to be a, a showcase and uh, for the work of Jim Dornan, which the camera is looking at right now. I wanted this to be the um, a key feature of this show. Jim's work is, isn't well known in New Zealand, but I did take some of his work to New York, the Outsider Art Fair, where it was picked up by the American Visionary Art Museum. Jim's work was the first New Zealand artist to be shown at that museum, which is in Baltimore. Uh, there's a big story behind Jim and his work. He's from small town Wairoa. A key feature of the story is that the work was saved from being thrown away by his young neighbor, his then young neighbor, Chris Wilson, who's here and who brought this work to Auckland for the show. I'm Chris Wilson. Um, I met Jim Dornan when I was a little kid and uh, I was fascinated by him. He painted theatrical backdrops for the pantomimes and so I was impressed. He disappeared for about six years. Uh, he would have been late 40s, went off to mental hospital and um, came back years later, six years later, and uh, painted some remarkable works on calico, which we'll see later. Subsequently, I photographed his works when, uh, when I was old enough to buy a camera. And um, in 1981, he died. And I rescued his paintings. They would have been um, destroyed. And uh, what I found when I um, went into his house was a whole lot of works on paper, which I had never seen before. These works here are some of those works. And um, I found them really interesting because they threw light on the larger works he'd worked up later. This one here is uh, a picture of a brain. He's just... Start, starting at this point to represent himself as a brain, not a stick figure, not a normal way we represent people, but just simply a brain. And his focus was obviously on his brain. He was in a mental hospital. And so that's the way he portrayed it. And this one kind of shows the situation of how home is a long, hard journey away, and he would probably like to be there, but it's, it's difficult. And his brain figure here is, is weeping. That's a lot of personal anguish in that particular painting. Others of Jim's work, such as this one here, are not so personal, but they're more speculations on the nature of being. So you've got a brain attached by different me uh, mechanical devices to another, a stomach, um, and it's a quirky little um, imaginative look on how, how people's existence, what powers it, what makes it go. Later on he did a painting which um, elaborates on that, a larger painting. This, this is it, um, called how, do, how Does the Mind Get Life from Food? So this is a direct... Um, development from the one in the back. When he came out of mental hospital, he started painting these large banner works, and um, they're all very consistent. They all portray the brain as a kind of an entity and a little figure. They're often comical. Um, they portray other people's stories. It's not just exclusively Jim looking at himself. Uh, this one was about a, um, a man he met who was a doctor. This one back with the pill bottle. Uh, he was an addict. Um, he met him in a mental hospital and uh, he died there, this guy. Um, he had access to drugs. He became an addict and he died in a mental hospital. And there's a visual pun on uh, 6699 going on there. And that was this man's story. In Jim's art, there's a, there's a lightness Runs running through it. Some of them, some of them are not so light. They're very serious, heavy topics, but others are just they were cartoony. They were light take, and he was a man who used to uh, laugh easily. And in this one, he's um, representing, uh, you know, what what humans are bound by. You know, man could if he had milk in his tea for a million years. And there's this little cartoon car. 
like a cow, in an old-fashioned cow bale there with its head in there so it can't run away, its back leg, which is a wheel tied up, and the little brain figure milking the cow. So whereas some of the others are more personal, this is a kind of a more um, comment on the universal you know, human being. This, this one here is also another one that's quite accessible. I think anybody can um, read what it's on about. Flogging the subconscious mind, um, there it is. It doesn't need much more explanation, whereas some of the others do need a kind of a narrative. And um, often that narrative's lost. He may have told me. Um, I photographed his work, as I said, in 1975, um, Jim was keen to have it photographed and uh, he related the stories behind some of them to me and I haven't, I haven't remembered what all those ones are if I was told but that one's quite clear without any, any other story this, this one here this one is another personal story it's a, uh, a woman was um, scavenging at the local dump and um, Presumably this is the woman, a portrait of her, and to burn two dollars in a clean bag at the tip is a reference to the local council um, insisting that people put their rubbish in, in throwaway bags. And uh, Jim's kind of making a, a statement about that, but it's, it's this woman's story and not, not a you know, personal interior scape of, of Jim Dornan's um, this is one of the paintings he did last in a series of paintings. What Jim would do was paint um, about, he'd paint both sides of a sheet of can canvas, calico, put them on a wooden um, board at the top, roll them up and uh, go off around the country and um, go visiting uh, art galleries sometimes, but uh, hospitals, psychologists, and he'd strike up a a conversation, a dialogue with people that that he could engage with, that he found, and they found the work interesting. But this is one of his later series, and in this one, uh, every one of these has is it some kind of pulse. So this is old pulse. Uh, on the back, it's um, it's a it's a different kind of pulse. It's a smile on the other side. This one would be um, somebody's story. Um, I, don't, I don't remember whose story it is, if I ever did get told, but um, it's poetic. It's got these words, a feeling fleeting, a dwindling feeling. So it doesn't need any more than that for you to you know, gain access to that painting. Beautifully painted Māori woman's face. Jim's work... Um, often involves a question um, or a statement or two different parts of a statement. It's like a headline and a subhead. Um, this one here, in, after 1975, sometime perhaps late 70s, Jim, most of, all of his paintings had this format. They had a large painting up here with, with deep tonal range. At the bottom they had a white area with text. Jim sometime decided to rethink his colour theory and he, he got rid of the darkness. He uh, replaced it with pastel colours and lightened them up and he painted in around the words down the bottom. So there's two versions of all of these paintings except for this one. This is the only one that he didn't, um, that he left as it was the earlier drawing that we um, looked at with home written on the side of the mountain that seemed so uh, a hard place to arrive at. Um, this is a development from there, but just to show the way Jim worked, um, this has now become the story of a man who took a horse around the East Cape, a man by the name of Jack Kimmel, um, hoping to go on a, a, a retirement holiday. He ended up pulling the horse, and here's the horse, um, so the idea of a reluctant creature being taken somewhere has obviously got parallels with the uh, one with home in the background. 
So it's both Jim's story, Jack Gimmel's story, and a kind of a statement about education and mental hospital, mental health. This painting here is... It's a painting that I had hanging on my own wall, and uh, it's very easy to live with. It's a um, gentle kind of... It's almost uh, Jim's epitaph. He's possibly painted it himself as an epitaph. Um, but it's such a gentle painting with a violin playing, and uh, it's, it's not kind of maudlin. It's, um, it's a lovely painting to be in the presence of. And uh, Jim Dornan listened to the tune of Promise, Goodbye and God Bless You. Um, when he died, he didn't have family. I went along as a friend um, and placed a wooden uh, marker on his grave that I'd carved his name in. Somebody later on um, picked it up and thought, what is this? Is it a pauper's grave? And that brought Jim's story to light again in the local paper and uh, that began a little campaign to raise some money to get a more permanent uh, gravestone on Jim's grave, and uh, which I made. And um, I used... Jim's own text is on the on the uh, bronze. It said Jim Dornan listening to the tune of promise, goodbye and God bless. I've included the work of Paul Nofke. I'm not even sure how to say his work. I only became aware of his work since I've been visiting Toyora. Uh, the work has been uh, very successful and it's, it's moved a lot of people. It's very strong work. And sadly, Paul Nofke passed away only last year. It was the immediate graphic quality. It was a sort of a purity of vision that I was um, struck by. They're strong works and they, um, they have a presence even from the other side of the gallery space. And a lot of people have, like I say, been quite moved by the work. They do communicate something about the human spirit. Andrew Blythe is... Uh, one of the artists of Toyora, who is unusual in that he's had um, uh, some acknowledgement at, at different levels. It's hard for any artist to get fully acknowledged, but Andrew's done well. His work uh, speaks to a modernist tradition, contemporary. His work is, is contemporary art. His process is thoughtful. Um, he's a natural painter. I like the way he is able to load his brush with paint to the right amount. He's a craftsman. He has done a lot of work. He works solidly, consistently. He's engaged with the creative process. And very fortunately, he's, um, he's been supported by Toyora, and now he's entered into the contemporary scene with support from the Tim Melville Gallery. He's, his work's been shown in New York, in uh, Belgium, uh, in Australia, in Melbourne, at uh, various art fairs, and he's in various collections, and he's, he's doing great, and uh, it's really wonderful to see his work being appreciated and, and sitting in the walls of uh, some very reputable spaces. His work features in the window, but uh, that's it. That's the roundup. Cheers. Come again next year.